Now, this is a favorite place for me. I love being with you, love the time of worship, and I've developed quite a few good friends here, and it's good to see you, brother. I didn't expect I'd get to today, but I'm delighted that I do. Um, I got to tell you a couple of funny things about this book, Thrive in Retirement. First of all is I don't believe in the word retirement. I checked my concordance, it's not there. Thriving is all through the Bible, but retirement isn't. And the funny thing is, though, the uh, publisher insisted on it, and there's a good reason. It's the only word we use in America to talk about this season of life. And so that's what it's about, the season of life, but it's not about shutting down because I don't believe God's got that design for us. The other thing I want you to know that you might not know is how much CFAN contributed to that. Do you know there's a lot of things that happened behind the scenes that you might not know about with the church? Your four pastors, Mark and Linda and Ken and Patty, spent a lot of time with me as we were working through formulating some of the principles here that can really change lives. It's a season of life that people haven't talked about enough to understand. It didn't even exist in the past. Do you realize that? If you go back 100 years and all previous human history, there was no season like this. You usually died shortly after you stopped working. <laughs> but these days, the common thing is, after you hit 65, you have another 20 to 30, maybe even 40 years of active life. And so that's, that's a great privilege but people don't know what to do with it. They say, uh, what am I going to do? I don't know. I just want to enjoy myself. Well, that sounds very nice. The only catch is, did anything significant happen in your life in the previous 30 or 40 years? You think you can go through that with no planning and nothing's going to happen to you? No, I think you need to think about it, and that's what the book's about. So I hope you get a chance to look at it. And it's not just for older people. It's about principles of life that apply to everyone. So whether you're 16 or 60 or 20 or 80, there's great truths in here for you. Hope you enjoy it. Well, got a lot of smart people in this room, and I wonder, do any of you, for entertainment, ever play trivia? Okay, some of you go for this. I want to show you some quotes. These are familiar quotes. I think you've all heard them. They're spoken often. Here's the trivia question. What do all these quotes have in common? Ah, uh -huh. somebody knew that right off. They are all from the Bible. They originated from the Bible. There are dozens of familiar statements that originate from the Bible, and I want to particularly call your attention to the last one, eat, drink, and be merry. That's an especially popular one. That shows up in your Bible three places. And the last time it shows up, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus spoke it, and we're going to be talking about that in a moment. It's also very popular for other reasons. Uh, if you go to Etsy... It's one of the most popular things that people put in their kitchens. <laughs> so if you want to uh, do that, you can find 2,000 ways to do that that are posted on Etsy. Very popular. What we're going to be talking about today is dreams. And for some people, eat, drink, and be merry is a dream. Well, eat, drink, and be merry is something that God's in favor of. He actually ordered that we have festivals and celebrations. That's a good thing. But if that's your only dream, that might get you in trouble. Can you imagine? Okay. So what do you consider a dream? What do you consider your dream? There are several kinds of dreams, of course. You can uh, have the dreams that you get from eating pizza just before you go to bed. <laughs> That's one kind of spontaneous, normal dream. And then there are supernatural dreams. Those are spectacular. I did quite a bit of work in the Middle East, and many Muslims who come to Christ do so because the Lord shows them who He is in a dream, reveals Himself. It's a spectacular thing. So those are two kinds of dreams, ordinary dreams and supernatural dreams. There's another kind somewhere in the middle. There's a the kind I'm talking about today, which is more a vision, a, a personal hope, an aspiration, that kind of a dream. I think we all know that one of the greatest speeches ever delivered was by Martin Luther King Jr., who said, I have a dream. It was that kind of a dream, and it's a good thing to have dreams. Whether you're a teenager or 90 years old, God wants you to have dreams. One of the great things about CFAN is you people talk about this kind of dream all the time, and I think you cannot talk about it too much because we become what we dream. Great things rarely happen by accident. I heard one time of a guy who caught a fish. He was out in his rowboat, and the fish jumped into it. 
I've never had that happen. Anybody ever had that happen? <laughs> That's rare. Most of the time, if you're going to catch a fish, you have to dream of doing that and bring your gear and your tackle and go about it in a thoughtful way. And that's true with most of the good things in life. You have to dream it. There was a doctor named Jonas who just hated polio. And he dreamed that one day it could be eradicated. And there is now a vaccine that carries his name, Jonas Salk. And polio is eradicated. But it began with a dream. He said, hope lies in dreams, in imagination, and in the courage of those who dare to make dreams into reality. Have you ever noticed with sports, whether pro sports or college sports, you can have a team that's failing, and they change the coach, same team, and suddenly they start winning. Now, some of it's technique, but most of it is the dream. The coach has been able to persuade the team that they can do it. And then when they do have that dream, they're able to begin winning. Well, I have a dream. I have a dream because I read Joel chapter 2. It says, old men <laughs> will dream dreams. <laughs> there are some old men that dream of the good old days. That's not what it's talking about. It's possible to dream of heaven. That's a good thing, but that's not what it's talking about. It's to dream that God is going to do something mighty in my life. That's the dream, and we're all supposed to have those dreams. And it's so important because one of the handful of top important passages in the Bible to me is Psalm 37.4. It says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, we're there, aren't we? I heard it from you today. You delight yourself in the Lord. What do you get? He'll give you the desires of your heart. What if your heart is empty? What if you have no desires? God can give you exactly what you are ready for. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so get the right dream deep inside your soul. Delight yourself in the Lord, and that's how you receive from God. Don't let your heart be empty. I remember once as a kid, uh, we had... Uh, Somebody gave us one of these assorted chocolates for the whole family. And, of course, that can produce an instant feud. <laughs> and so mom and dad said, We're, each kid gets one piece one, each day. And so you, you look them over carefully. You look uh, them over all day long, checking them out. And you gotta wait, so you're ready for the selection. My personal thing about chocolate is that I like it with nuts. And so I turned them upside down to read the little signs below to see what's supposed to be in it. And they had one that was sort of a gourmet version of a Reese's. And it had some sort of peanut filling in it. So I was waiting for it and hoping my sisters didn't pick it before me. So when my turn came, I picked it. And I was excited. It looked so good. And my first bite tasted good. I like chocolate. But then, huge disappointment. I think the machine clogged when they were filling this one. It was hollow. I didn't get the good stuff. I didn't get the payoff. Do you know that dreams can be like that? So there's three ways you can encounter your dreams. You can have no dreams. Don't go there. You can have hollow dreams, like that disappointing piece of chocolate, or you can have full dreams. Well, it's story time. We're going to talk about one man's dreams story of a man where Jesus used that phrase, eat, drink, and be merry. And by the way, do you know your Bible is 75% stories? So if you like stories, you ought to love your Bible. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, stories are popular these days, too. We have a new type of story since the internet came around, social media. They're called memes. Have you ever seen these things? They have a little story that's a picture and then just a few words, and they can be very entertaining, like, like that one. Now, but before the era of the internet, people still use stories to communicate big ideas, and when Jesus did that, they would often put a label on it. Instead of a meme, they'd simply say, it's a parable. Parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, somebody said. Okay. So Luke chapter 12, it began with an incident. This is one of those times when Jesus was attracting a big crowd, and from this big crowd, somebody shouts out and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me because our father died. 
I'm going to take a little aside from the scripture discussion to mention to you, if you don't know this, the single incident that breaks down families is when somebody dies. And it isn't over the death of the person, it's the disputes that arise over it. Grandpa's old gold watch, which doesn't even run, has sentimental value, and Joe thought he was going to get it, and Sally thought she was going to get it, and so they never talked to each other again. Don't let that happen. So prepare for your departure. That's a loving thing. If you don't want your family to blow up, don't contribute to it. And I just one more plug for the book. In the back of the book, there's an extra set of resources. There are worksheets that will help that not happen in your family. So love your family by being prepared. Have a good will, fresh up to date. They usually need to be updated every five years. But in addition, there's a lot of other information that needs to be covered. Okay, enough said about that. Jesus' response was a bit of a surprise. Because Jesus changed the subject. Have you ever had a situation where you took something to the Lord and the answer you got wasn't the one you were expecting? (laughs) Now, let me tell you what can happen if you're not accustomed to taking things to the Lord. Number one, you can take anything to the Lord, any subject at all. He's happy to have it. He's happy to even hear your anger. If you're frustrated, you can talk to him about that. That's a good thing to do. Don't bottle it up. Share it with him. However, be aware that what's going to happen is God will respond especially if you're listening for it. And it may not be what you're expecting, and that's what he did with this fellow. He said, who put me in charge of those kinds of disputes with you? And he went further to say, there's something you got to look out for. There's a grave danger here because you're concerned about something you don't have. And that isn't what produces life. There is no life in stuff. Stuff is inanimate. That's not what your life is worth. Your worth is not your net worth. There's something else about you that's far more important. Look out. Be careful. By the way, what I'm doing, I'm going to be a storyteller here. And so you know it's actually from the Bible. We're going to put the scriptures on the screen. (laughs) So I'm paraphrasing a little loosely at points. But watch out. I had an incident one time when uh, I was traveling in Jamaica. Do you know there are two Jamaicas? There is the resort Jamaica, where you can go sit on a beautiful coastline, eat incredible food, perfect weather, and you're in this beautiful spot, and there are armed guards all around the periphery. And then there's the real Jamaica, where the Jamaicans live, and life is hard for many of these people. I was there in that Jamaica, in downtown Kingston, because I was working with a ministry that was working in those communities, walking down the street with a colleague, a friend, a Jamaican man, uh, Paul Miller. And on this trip, it was especially delightful because my young son was traveling with me. He's an adult now, but he was six or seven years old at the time. And we're walking down the street, and if you haven't been in these kinds of settings, you know, there's a lot of decay. There is a lot of garbage. There, the, the street was cracked and in bad repair. Um, people were delightful, but there was a lot of hard life in that environment. So we were walking down the street talking. He was explaining to me what was going on in this community and, and some of the interventions that were happening in order to try to help that. And as we got along, about a block away, there was a woman that started yelling. She started screaming louder and louder and waving her arms. And I turned to Paul and said, what, what's going on here? Is she okay? Or what's the matter? He said, I, I don't know. And I kept watching her. And as we kept walking, she got louder and she started running toward us. And there finally got to a point that she came right up to us and grabbed my son. And I thought, well, she's a large lady and I think I could catch her if she runs off with him. But then she turned and pointed. We weren't looking at our feet. Somebody had stolen a manhole cover, and there was a great pit down there, and my little son was about to step into that thing. I gave her a hug and shed a few tears. She may have saved his life for all I know, and I was so thankful for her warning. How do you feel about warnings? Because there's some of the hard stuff in this message today. We as Americans like happy stories. Sometimes we're not so happy to hear warnings. 
But Jesus could not have been more explicit. He said, watch out, because there's a great danger here. Well, and then he built on the story. He told the fact there about the principle, but then he went further and actually told a story to embellish it. And I like stories because it adds color and makes it more memorable. And here's the story. He says, there was a rich man that had a lot of land, and did he ever have a bumper crop? He had a really good year. And so what happened was, with this abundant harvest, the guy says to himself, hmm, what am I going to do? My barns can't hold all the stuff. This is better than I ever imagined. It's what I wanted. You know, we have so many phrases to talk about that kind of a setting. We could say he hit pay dirt, or we could say uh, he was living the dream, okay? Or he had a bumper crop. Uh, he's ready to be in the lap of luxury, big success, moving to easy street, one big, okay? We're used to talking about that, and that's exactly where he was. But now back to the story. He says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I'm going to say to my soul, soul, take it easy from here on. You're set. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then as the story goes on, God spoke to him and said, you're a fool. Because if that's your dream, you're going to die tonight. You're never going to see that dream. That dream's going to go poof. It's going to be gone. There is a season to party, but that can't be your only dream. And then Jesus takes it a step further, lest we miss the point. And he says, so it is with everyone who has the wrong kind of dream and is not rich toward God. This brought me up short, and I'll tell you why. Again, thinking about retirement, I've been thinking a lot about it in the last couple of years in writing this book, and the popular notions about retirement. This story is a perfect picture of the American view of retirement. How could it have been more successful? This was an honest man. There is nothing in this story to hint that there was anything dishonest about what he did. God blessed his fruitfulness his yield was great. He had a lot of prosperity. Honest prosperity, he's set for the rest of his life. Isn't that the picture of a perfect retirement or a perfect life? And you don't have to be retirement age. Has anybody ever bought a lottery ticket? Don't raise hands. <laughs> Has anybody ever negotiated and said, God, if you'll just let me win this one, I will tithe double. <laughs> Why? So I can eat, drink, and be merry. Just be on vacation for the rest of my life. Something about that is very sobering because Jesus said that was foolish. And Jesus isn't a killjoy. Actually, the New York newspaper, the Daily News, did a long story on lottery winners. The headline was, The Curse of the Lottery. You know what they found? Was one-third of the lottery winners go bankrupt, and the majority of them, 70% of them, run into financial difficulties of some kind. So they're worse off than when they won it. Wealth is not the problem. The dream is the problem. It isn't how much you have of stuff. It's how much stuff has you. One sociologist estimates that 80% of our waking hours are spent earning money thinking about money, or spending money. Life is not measured by your possessions. There is a myth that is a popular American myth that if you just have enough money, you can live happily ever after. Well, there's a uh, great prophet in America. His name is Dr. Phil. <laughs> and he has this great line. It's a question. How's that working for you? Well, let me just cite a few statistics to drive home the significance of what Jesus was talking about. Because in the last hundred years in this country, our life expectancy has almost doubled. And we are the wealthiest nation in the history of humanity. And how is it going? Well, let me cite a couple of tough things. This is warning. This is cautionary. If you compare the divorce rate that's called gray divorce, 
This is people who have raised a family together. They paid off their mortgage together. They've lived together as husband and wife for 20, 25 years, and then they break up. That divorce rate today, compared to 1960, is up 700%. So this dream that retirement is just one grand vacation isn't working out so well. How's it going for you? Well, 40% of older adults are clinically depressed. Not just unhappy, clinically depressed. This got talked about on CNN the other day. Look at this. It's hard to believe, right? I mean, we're, we're the, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We spend close to $4 trillion a year on health care, and our life expectancy is going down. I mean, it, you said it hasn't happened in 100 years. You know what was happening 100 years ago? We were in the middle of a world war and a global flu pandemic at the same time. So that just gives you some context. Top three causes of, uh, of new spiking causes of death, drug overdoses, which we talk a lot yeah. about. Suicides have gone up 30%. Thirty percent. I mean, there's an existential stress going on here, and liver cirrhosis due to alcoholism. Wow. So these are all. They're called the deaths of despair, and it's you know something that's predominantly happening in this country. And it, again, I just can't say this enough. It's all the other news that goes on in the world. When you see the headline that life expectancy yeah. in the U.S. is going down, that should concern you before you see anything else. Is there something unique about the United States? Well, it's worth pointing out that if you look at the developed world, we're the only country where this is happening. Pretty sobering, isn't it? Have you ever heard the term wasted youth? That's talking about a teenager or somebody in their 20s who just wants to party all the time and they don't build anything constructive for their lives. That's a sad thing. But you know, we have wasted adulthood. The majority of what's talked about and expected in this country is to waste retirement. You can waste any season of your life, and it really ties to what's going on on the inside and what dreams you carry. So again, let me drive home this cautionary tale. Don't be caught with no dreams. Don't fall for hollow dreams. Let's talk about full dreams. Are you ready for some good news? God has some good things in store for us. I mentioned earlier how Psalm 37 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. The other one that I meditate on every day of my life is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Because it says that I am and you are God's handiwork. I like to paraphrase that too. You know what I call myself? I'm God's hobby. <laughs> you know what God does for fun? He dreams up things that he can do through me. Because the greatness is God, not my creation. I don't have that much good stuff in me. But he is absolutely amazing. But you are his hobby too. In fact, I was talking with the folks before the service and talking about how much I love Ephesians 2.10. One brother says, well, you know, in the Amplified Bible, what it says, it's a prearranged deal. You know what happens to people at this point in life? People try to sell me a prearranged funeral. I'm not worried about that. When the funeral comes, you can do anything you want with me. Because I'm going to, the real me is going to be dancing somewhere. <laughs> but what about the prearrangement that is for you now and next year and five years from now? Will you walk in it? The saddest people I know are older adults who are prosperous and they don't know what to do with themselves. Meaning is better than money. And God has prearranged good things for you, full dreams. He made a plan in advance and it doesn't stop at 65, I can tell you that for sure. My dream, my ultimate dream, is when I meet Jesus, I want to hear, well done. But I want something extra with that. I want him to tell me why. And what I'd like for him to say is, Eric, I got to do most of what I dreamed of your doing. Wouldn't that feel good? Yes. Can you want that? Because desire and dreaming goes together. We desire and dream, and when we have desires in our heart, then God will bring them to pass. That's Psalm 37. So, so let's begin to unpack this. What happens with a full dream? First thing is it's custom. I can't tell you what it is. You need to walk into it. Well, that doesn't sound fair, does it? Already, Pastor mentioned that fair has nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay, we are completely agreed on that. But let's, what do we do? 
Well, the first thing that you do is you make a decision. But a decision alone accomplishes nothing. You've made lots of big decisions in your life. You decided somebody to marry. You decided you were going to go to college if you did. You decided you were going to buy a house if you did. And the decision alone did not accomplish anything. Because you're not married until you fill out some paperwork and have a ceremony of some kind. You don't get the house until you get the mortgage and you do all the paperwork. You don't even get to get a car until you do some of the steps that are necessary to fulfill the dream that you had. So a decision is a good place to start. If you have not yet made a decision that Jesus is going to be Lord of your life, please make that decision today. And there'll be people after the service that'll meet you right down here and help you walk through that process. That's a great first step. But... Don't stop there. Jesus is the Savior. He will save us from our sins, but he will save us from other stuff. He will save us from no dreams. He will save us from hollow dreams. He will save us to the uttermost so we don't have wasted lives. God doesn't want to waste you. He loves you, and you are his hobby. Don't miss it. I'm fairly newlywed. Can you tell? There's a good story behind it. God faithfully blessed my first marriage, and my first wife was an overachiever and made it to heaven before me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a little side here that I don't normally share with people, but you're friends, okay? Um, she used to say that one of her dreams, see where dreams will get you, was to be on the planning party for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think they called a committee meeting. So I kind of wish she hadn't said that, but uh, God was gracious through that whole experience. But God also brought another lady into my life who had lost her husband to cancer as well, and we married about five years ago. The marriage was not the ceremony. The marriage is now. Diane and I work at it to build a life together, and because I should. Well, yeah. Yeah. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is I want the benefits of being connected with her, of being close to her, and vice versa. And there's a richness that comes out of that. That's what it means to be married. And so that's what happens when you come to the Lord Jesus. You make a decision that he's going to be Lord of your life, and then actually the Bible compares that to marriage. You, you then grow into that relationship. And one of the things that will happen as you grow into it, you're going to find that your piece of candy has got some filling on the inside. <laughs> Because there is a fullness to that dream that comes about. Jesus said, be rich toward God. How do I do that? Well, I think it really has to do with what you do on the inside more than what you do on the outside. It isn't that you have to serve more or spend more time in Bible study or the rest. All those are good things to do. But really, the issues of life happen on the inside, and that's what Jesus said to this fellow who called out to him in the crowd. Don't you understand your life is not worth the things that you have? It's really what's going on on the inside, and am I your dream, and do you live with me in that dream where I can create spectacular things? Prophet Jeremiah had a conversation with God one time, and the Lord said to him, I'm going to show you wonderful things. So God's fullness for you is going to be wonderful. It's going to be custom for you. And it's going to be something he makes happen. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. The, the hard stuff is on him. But he wanted to do it. And we get to enjoy it. So don't miss that. So... We've been talking about a story, a great story, a parable that Jesus told. If you'll permit me, I would like to tell you a story that's not in the Bible. Just see if this catches your fancy. Once upon a time, this is an ancient legend from the Middle East. Once upon a time, there was a boy who was walking in the desert. If I walked in the desert, I'd get lost because to me, all sand dunes look alike. You know, without my cell phone to give me a map, I'd be in big trouble. But this boy knew his way around the desert. And he was walking along, and everything looked normal, looked familiar to him, until in the distance, he thought he saw a dot. And he decided that he would uh, 
pursue what that was and go walk over by it. And it looked stranger and stranger. It was small, but it just didn't belong there. It was a green dot in this brown parched desert. And he walked over by it and saw not only was it a little green plant, but it had a bright red single flower on it. He said, and his mind just raced. What could this mean? Did somebody put it here? But there's no pot. What is this? And so he lovingly scooped down, stretched down, and scooped it up in his hands. And when he did, there was this loud rumble. And the sand dune in front of him opened to reveal a cave. He couldn't see inside the cave because it was so bright outside that he had to kind of walk into the cave. And when he did he discovered it was filled with treasure. So he set the plant down and started fumbling around in this treasure. There was, there was gold and there were gems and it was, it was huge. And he thought, wow, look at this. And he scooped a bunch of it up in his arms. And he thought, you know, this is a fortune. I'm going to be rich. And he turned and started to walk back out into the sun and a voice came and simply said, don't forget the best. Okay. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. What's the best? So he picked around and decided that your average diamond per pound is worth more than gold. And so he started switching stuff around. And he started walking back out to step into the sun. And the voice came again and said, don't forget the best. And he did this several times where he tried to switch around, pick up different pieces of treasure to get the best he could. And then he says, you know, I'm not that greedy. <laughs> I, I'll be happy with just this, thank you. And so he started to walk out and the voice came again, don't forget the best. And as he finally went out to the sunshine, the big rumble came again, everything returned to normal, and the treasures that had been in his arms turned to sand. And the voice came again and said, the best, the key, was the flower. You left it inside. Friend, have a dream. Don't fall for hollow dreams. But don't forget the best. Be rich toward God. Have your way with us, Lord. <laughs>